Somebody had asked me about prayer. They asked me if I prayed, and, and I thought, well, it depends on what you mean by that exactly. It's like I don't ask God for favors or for wishes, you know. But I do think that if you sit on the edge of your bed and things aren't going very well for you, and you ask what foolish thing you're doing to make it worse, that you'll get an answer right now. And it won't be the one you want, but it might be the one that if you listen to would set things straight. I don't think that I've ever been in a situation where if something wasn't going right for me and I sat and thought, okay, uh, all right, I'm willing to figure out what I'm doing wrong, which is a big thing to think because you never know how much you're doing wrong. It might be something that you really don't want to contend with. But if you clear some space to meditate on that, the probability that you'll figure out something that you did that was stupid, that's bending you and twisting you in the wind, you'll, you'll get an answer. Obviously, if you have a problem and you think about it, you can think up a solution. And it's not obvious how you do that. You know, I mean, it's not like you know how you're manipulating your neurons or something. It happens of its own accord in some sense, like you can participate in it, I guess, and you can interfere with it, and it seems to take a certain amount of willpower, but it still all happens mysteriously behind the scenes. And I would say this sort of attitude towards, let's say, prayer that we're discussing is just an extension of that. And it's something like, well, you admit that there's a problem first, and then you ask for the minimum necessary intervention, which would be, all right, well, I'd like to move forward on this some small amount that someone like me could actually manage, and I, I'd be willing to carry it out. And then you reorient the way you're thinking as a consequence of that, and something usually pops out of the abyss to guide you. In most religious systems, humility is stressed, right? Because humility says, I have a problem, and I'm stuck. And humility says, whatever I'm doing isn't working, and therefore I'm wrong. And so, like, as soon as you say that, you admit to yourself that your current frame of reference is faulty, and then you start opening the door to a different kind of thinking, which is more creative thinking, it's more lateral thinking. Well, I'm wrong, but that's not necessarily a problem because I could be right if I thought some other way. There's almost no end to the utility of trying to figure out which ways that you're wrong, because there's lots of them. And every time you discover one, then you don't have to be quite so wrong anymore. That's a really good deal. You know, one of the things I was trying to stress in 12 Rules for Life, and also in this first book I wrote, Maps of Meaning, is that you need to decide at some point in your life whether you're more in love with what you know or what you don't know. You know, and people tend to be in love with what they know because you don't want to have that shaken and challenged, and it's not surprising. But the problem with that is, is that you don't know enough unless everything's going perfectly for you and everything around you, you set in order perfectly. It's like your ignorance outweighs your knowledge. So you should make friends with what you don't know. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today. You have to get your markers for success right because otherwise you can end up in the situation you described, which is that like there's always people out there who are doing far better than you on pretty much anything you yeah. want to imagine. And if all you're doing is seeing yourself in their reflected light, let's say, then it's going to be pretty damn dismal. But it's not a good comparison because, well, first of all, there's danger in just comparing yourself to others, period, because they're not you and God only knows what struggles they had to undertake to get to where they were or what burdens they're currently carrying that you're not aware of. You just don't know yeah, any sure. of that. But you can certainly contrast yourself with yourself. And that's a lot better. One of the things I tell people when they're trying to develop a vision for their life or an implementable plan is um, make a bad plan. Like make the best one you can, but don't get obsessive about it. It's like make a yeah. plan, implement it. You'll figure out when you implement it why it's stupid exactly and then you can fix it a little bit and then you can fix it a bit more and then you can fix it a bit more and then eventually you get a good plan you know there's lots of different ways to interpret the world and you can maybe even make a case that there's an endless number of ways to interpret the world and the problem with that is that it kind of disorients you in terms of what you should be doing but just because there's a very large number of ways to interpret the world doesn't mean there's a very large number of pro productive meaningful and sustainable ways to interpret the world and one of the things you do have to do is figure out how you can conduct yourself today so that you don't upset the apple cart in a week or a month or a year, right? Because you're playing an iterating game. There's a lot of emphasis in the New Testament, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, on paying attention to the day. So while the thing that's so interesting about the day, the day is like a page in a book. Of course, there's many pages in a book, but the page repeats. And so one of the things I often had my clients do, I'll tell you a little story. I had one client who was spending about 45 minutes a night fighting with his young son about when to go to bed. 
And so, you know, they weren't having a pleasant time of it because it was just a constant battle. And that's common. Like, it's very common for parents of young children to be locked in a battle that occurs day after day. Sometimes it's around eating. Sometimes it's toilet training. Sometimes it's general behavioral issues. Sometimes it's bedtime. So we did some arithmetic. It's like, okay, 40 minutes a day. So that's 280 minutes a week. So that's, let's say, five hours. It's 20 hours a month. It's 240 hours in a year. That's six work weeks. That's a month and a half. You're spending a month and a half of work weeks doing nothing but fighting with your son. What makes you think you're going to like him? Don't don't fool yourself. Yeah. Anything that's every day is a significant percentage of your life. You know, because you, what you you're awake, let's say 16 hours. Five of those hours are basically maintenance. So you got about 11, and then seven of those are work. So now you're down to four. And so if you're spending 15 minutes a day doing something painful and stupid and you do it every day, it's like 10% of your productive life. Because people think backwards. They think, well, I have a vacation coming up and that's really important. It's like, no, it's not. You're only going to do it once. It's not that important. How you treat each other at lunchtime, if you eat together every day, that's your life. Yeah. Fix that. Yeah. Get it Get it so that the food's good. Get it so that you're happy with the people that are sitting there. Fix that. It's like, poof, 10% of your life is fixed. That judge that you have internally, which is, let's call it the voice of conscience, it suffers from a certain generic quality. You know, so it, it's it's judging you in a cliched manner. That doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's cliched. It's not fully informed. And so what you want to do throughout your life is have a dialogue with that. Because it needs to learn just like what it's judging needs to learn. You know, it's, it's not that much different than having a relationship, like a long-term relationship, like a marriage, because you're continually communicating with any luck and you're modifying each other in the communication. And you have that judge which you need because it makes you alert and makes you watchful sure. and makes you consider your actions. But it isn't God, that internal voice. It doesn't know everything, so it needs to learn too. And so I think it's reasonable to engage it in dialogue and not to make the instantaneous assumption that just because the judge says that what you're doing is wrong, that it's absolutely correct in its judgment. You want to fight back and say, no, I, I, I'm going to defend myself against that internal voice. No, and I'm not going to listen to it because it might be right. It might be right. You want to listen. But it needs to learn too. And so you can get that dialogue going. Always take into account the cost of what you're doing now. Right? Because what people tend to think is, well, what I'm ever, whatever I'm doing now is risk-free. And here's a bunch of options. It's like, no. Whatever you're doing right now has all sorts of risks. You're just you're just blind to them because you've habituated to them. They've become invisible. But you can't wait around to make things better on the assumption that what you're doing already is without risk. So when people come to see me clinically, for example, and maybe I'm helping them figure out what to do with their career. So they say, well, I think I might need to change jobs. It's like, okay, what's stopping you? Well, there's lots of things, right? Well, I have a job. That's something. Offers me some, some security. My CV isn't up to date. People don't like updating their CVs. It's partly because it's hard, but also because they're not very proud of it, right? So even if they did update it, it doesn't say what they want it to say. So then updating your CV turns into sort of updating your life, and that's a complicated thing. And then maybe you don't like being interviewed, because most people don't, and maybe you don't like being judged. And maybe you don't like the fact that if you look for another job, there'll be 50 rejections for every one acceptance. It's like there's a whole plethora of terrible things you have to encounter if you want to change jobs. So you think, well, I'm not going to do that. The risk is too high. It's like, fair enough. What's the risk of doing what you're doing? And that's easy. Accelerating suffering. Let's say you're 35 now and you don't change your job. Well, you'll be 40 so fast you can't even believe it. It'll just happen. Like it'll take five years, but it happens, it happens overnight at this, in the same way. And if you haven't changed, then you'll be the same except worse. So that's the alternative. If you don't find what you're doing sufficiently productive or responsible or meaningful or engaging or all of that. So here's the choice. Your life is either meaningful or meaningless. Okay, so let's go through the meaningless part first.
course, I don't want it to be meaningless. It's like, yeah, just hold on a second. Nothing you do matters. And so impulsive pleasure is the order of the day. No responsibility. You can do whatever you want. It's like Pleasure Island in Pinocchio. Right? Or it's, the, it's like Neverland in, 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 in Peter Pan. You're still a kid. You can play all the time. Impulsive pleasure. And, and no responsibility. That's the reward for meaninglessness. Okay. I think, well, you know, there's something to be said about that. But then the, the other side is, okay, well, let's say you want your life to... Okay, then what you do matters. It actually matters, right? Make a mistake, hurts you, hurts your family, hurts the world in a deeper way than you think. And you have to be awake to that. 